Um, so as I said, um, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Kristen Thompson and I will be uh, moderating the chat. Um, during our meeting um, this afternoon. If you want to take a moment um, at the bottom or toward the bottom of your screen to locate the chat, if you um, can click on that, that's one way. If you have uh, brief questions during the session, um, I'll do my best to answer them um, in real time. Uh, but if you have more in-depth questions that will require kind of a more lengthy answer, we'll hold those to the end. Um, and I, if you want to just take a moment now to introduce yourself <coughs> in, in the chat, if you wish, um, to just say your name and um, say just a brief bit of what is your interest or connection to the cable area, your interest in this project, um, that would be fantastic. I am going to take a moment also to mute everyone um, just to cut down on the background noise. Um, so later on, um, if you have a question or you want to interact with folks, uh, you'll need to unmute yourself, um, but we're going to keep participants uh, muted um, for now. Um, and I think I'll hand off now to um, Bill Butzik. Um, Bill? Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, and Bill is our um, board chair at Landmark Conservancy, and uh, I'll let you take it from there, Bill. Okay, well, thanks. Um, I, I'm, I'm Bill Butzik and I live in Menominee with Jane, my wife, and I'm now retired from the dairy industry after making uh, Swiss Miss hot chocolate for 35 years and seven years of making cheese before that. Um, but in 1978, I came to uh, Cable because I had read about this unique ski race and uh, thought it would be fun. Uh, my father-in-law had purchased skis for Jane and I for Christmas and uh, I would really enjoyed the little bit of adventure I had skiing, so I thought, wow, this is certainly going to be fun to try. Well, it certainly turned out to be an adventure. Now, I knew very little about uh, cross-country skiing, and I waxed my wood skis from tip to tail with a, with, a green, with a binder, and then I put a little bit of hard wax over top of it, and I could climb every single hill on the Berkey Binder Trail. The only problem was I had to walk down every single hill because I didn't have any glide <laughs> until I got I got to the uh, I got to the ice on the lake and it, it took off my binder and then I could finally uh, ski. So anyway, it was quite an in introduction to uh, learning how to ski. But uh, every year uh, since 1978, I've come to Cable and uh, and continued to ski in the uh, uh, American Berkey Minor Ski Race and. Um, I've really, because of that experience, I think of being in the woods, it's, uh, I've really uh, come to actually love the Northwoods and, uh, and the Telmar property. And I would say my experience skiing is really the, probably the number one reason I joined the Landmark Conservancy Board and wanted to use my volunteer time to help in land conservation. Um, so obviously uh, the Telmark area is special to me. You know, and every once in a while you, uh, a dream of winning the lottery. I think we've all dreamed of winning the lottery. And I, back when Telmark was having their financial problems, I said, wow, if I win the lottery, what I'm going to do is buy Telmark. Of course, I only bought one or two tickets. And uh, <laughs> so I never won the lottery. But I think um, um, but what we've got coming up with the, with the Telmark Forest Reserve is, is, is a unique and special opportunity. Um, so in a way, maybe we can all kind of help to uh, win a lottery where we're able to protect this, uh, protect this land. Um, and so with that, you know, I, I think it's, uh, I'm glad we're all here today. So I, again, I wanna thank you for, for joining us to have this chat about the Telmark Forest Reserve. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Rick Remington, who is our conservation manager at uh, uh, Landmark. And Rick's got a wealth of experience and he's gonna share information on the Telmark Forest Reserve with us. Rick. Thank you, Bill. Um, well, I wish I had uh, some great snazzy and colorful photos of myself with uh, ski garb on or running gear or bicycling gear or something, but I don't. So you're just going to have to suffice with seeing, you know, pictures of trees and maps. Um, I guess what I'd like to do this evening, and thanks again for coming, everybody, is uh, just take a few minutes um, and kind of give a uh, Landmark Conservancy 101 to everybody. There may be some new, uh, new faces on the line today. And I wanna make sure everybody um, just has an idea of the kind of work that we do. Uh, so Landmark is, uh, 
is a relatively new organization. We've only been around since 2018, so a little over three years. But we were actually formed through the merger of two land trusts, West Wisconsin Land Trust and Bayfield Regional Conservancy, who both were around for 25, 30 years. So I like to say that we're a new land trust, but we've got old bones. And that includes both staff and board from uh, both organizations. Um, in 2020 and into uh, the current year, we were joined by uh, Couderay Waters Regional Land Trust. Uh, after a couple of years of discussions, um, you know, they wanted to see um, enhanced conservation activity in the Sawyer County, Greater Hayward area, and thought that uh, the best way to do that was, uh, was by joining forces with Landmarks. So we, we welcomed uh, their board members, uh, one of which we've uh, added to our board, as well as their members and their protected lands and are uh, happy to be serving that area now. Uh, so Landmark currently has uh, nine staff members, I believe uh, 14 or 15 uh, great board members of which Bill is our fearless leader. And we have an office in Menominee and an office uh, up in Bayfield. Both of those were historical office places by, uh, by West Wisconsin and by Bayfield Regional Land Trust. Um, we consider ourselves a 501c3 private nonprofit conservation group. That's why we're overseen by a board and we do land conservation in Northwest Wisconsin. So what is actually does Landmark do? Uh, well, we work in this 20, 20 county area uh, depicted on the map and all of those little brown and blue dots are projects that we've done scattered across those 20, uh, uh, 20 counties. Um, all of those dots include private conservation easements, which are the blue dots and those are privately and some publicly held lands that are protected under private recorded permanent conservation easements, uh, which our staff monitors and enforces annually. The brown dots uh, are, are properties that contain some level of public access, some of which are conservation easements, some of which are now owned by other projects, uh, other partners, and some of which we currently own. Yep, hang on a second. This gives you a little uh, closer look at some of those lands that have protected public access. So I mentioned some of those we currently own, which is about uh, maybe 2,000, 2,200 or so acres. Um, some of those are owned by county government, some by the Wisconsin of Department of Natural Resources or US Fish and Wildlife uh, or other private nonprofit conservation groups, but they're all places that we invested staff time and energy and resources in to accomplish over the years and have found the best way to manage them is by turning them over to other public entities. A couple of those sites that you might be familiar with would be the Devil's Punch Bowl uh, down here in Menominee, the Brownstone Trail up in Bayfield, uh, one of our newest preserves, Tyler Forks Community Forest, which is over in Ashland County, uh, adjacent uh, to Copper Falls. Um, let me jump ahead here. And what you're going to see here is uh, kind of a relatively new, uh, a new emphasis for Landmark Conservancy. You really can't turn on the news these days without hearing something about the climate crisis underway on our planet. Um, Landmark has made a very conscious and thoughtful decision that we're not gonna point fingers at anybody. We're not gonna say what caused climate change or is it happening? We've pretty much come to the agreement that it is happening and we're gonna use the best tool in our toolbox to combat it. We do land protection. And so the best thing we can do for this organization is to protect land in the right place. So we spent quite a bit of time uh, locating and discussing and coming to terms with what we call our focus areas for climate resiliency. These are some of the areas in Northwest Wisconsin, at least, that represent some of the, uh, the best opportunities we have for biodiversity. Um, and if we can protect land in those areas, it's going to give species the opportunity to adapt, to migrate, to move from place to place as our climate continues to change. Uh, the other map here that shows the uh, orange and green dots are just some of the projects that we've got underway and some of the recently completed projects since our merger many of which are located in, in those focus areas. Okay, now I'm going to jump ahead to the Telemark property. And again, I'm gonna assume that uh, many of you, probably all of you on the call know a lot about the Telemark property, probably more than me. So I'm gonna give a really brief history. 
Uh, the property uh, was purchased by Tony Wise back in 1947. The historic lodge was built in 1972. And the, Ameri the first American Birkbeiner race, which Bill didn't do, although he almost did all of them, was in 1973. Um, so it's got a long history of public recreational use. And that race just continues to grow, to grow year after year. <clears throat> Excuse me. The property you see depicted in red uh, is roughly, I want to say, about 750 or 800 acres or so, and was purchased in this year, 2021, by the American Birkbeiner Ski Foundation. Um, hats off to those guys, because I've seen, you know, a number of different ideas and plans and schemes over the last, oh, maybe say decade and a half of what could be done with that property. And uh, some of the things I, I liked what I saw and I wish it would have come to fruition. And some of the things were a little bit scary and sketchy. Um, and so I was just tickled to hear that they had pulled the trigger and really stuck their necks out and purchased that property. And that kind of brings the modern era, era of, uh, of Telemark into focus and what we'll be talking about uh, more coming up. So I can't tell this story without, you know, again, giving hats off to our, our partner and our seller in this endeavor, which is the uh, ABSF. Uh, when they purchased this property, you know, they took a risk, just like any nonprofit does in making large expenditures for, uh, for assets um, and have a vision for the property of developing kind of a premier outdoor recreational facility, ski, hike, bike, snowshoe, fat bike, downhill ski, uh, things that have been going on there for years, but really bump it up a notch. They also decided uh, to sell a portion of the property to help fund some of the improvements on the property and to take down that old whale of a lodge that, uh, that used to reside there and had some plans to protect the middle section of the property where many of the trails are located. You see that in brown on the map there um, on your right. Uh, that's kind of where Landmark entered into the conversation. Um, I was actually looking back at my calendar today to see the time frame of this because things get a little blurry as you look back over, you know, where you've come the last year or so. And uh, we actually had a call with American Birkbeiner last January. Um, and at that time, we were talking about the potential for a conservation easement uh, on some portion of the property. And that conversation is still going on today. Um, we didn't really draw lines on a map. We just were uh, sharing facts and ideas and talking about our mutual intent to protect a portion of that property. Um, and that's where kind of we entered into the, uh, the potential protection of, of, uh, of the Telemark property. Um, fast forward a couple months and we became aware at that time that ABSF was thinking about selling that Western portion in orange uh, that you see there. Um, and we wondered at that time, how is that gonna impact our conservation? We were still having a conversation over, you know, which acres should be included in that and what we might include and what would the terms be and so forth. And a number of community members, some of which I believe are on the call uh, today, brought it to our attention that this would be a great idea for Landmark to try to buy this property. Um, so we nodded our heads and, and listened and the calls continued to come in. And I'll be honest, um, not a week goes by around here where someone doesn't call our office with an idea of what we should buy uh, or buy their land or have other land that they wish we would buy. And we spend a, a lot of time as a staff sort of sifting through all of these concepts and trying to make, you know, the best decisions we can for this organization and more importantly for the ecological resources we're trying to protect. So the first thing we did is, uh, is we took a look at this potential opportunity which is the orange piece there and said, well, why should we protect this? And, and, and the, uh, the conservation values of the property became apparent really fast. One of the, uh, the main focus of our, of our uh, climate resilience goals is to protect large blocks of intact habitat to allow for those corridors for species to shift from place to place. And this property had all of that, whether you look at the whole property, the potential easement piece in green, the part that we've now since acquired there in that funky shade of orange, uh, the, pro the, the property had all those uh, attributes that we like to see protected. The vision we had for it was largely on site, a mixed healthy older forest with climate resilient species that will only improve over time. 
and an awesome opportunity to engage the community. Obviously, people care about the site because they've been calling our office, uh, inquiring if we could do something about to prevent the sale or possibly to intervene and buy it ourselves. Um, so we looked at those two things and we said, wow, this, this has some merits. And again, a lot of opportunities come through here and have interesting merits, both conservation and public recreation focus. But then we have to think about, do we have the capacity? Do we have the resources? Do we have the means to manage it? And all of that has to sift through our staff and ultimately the decision uh, resides with our board of directors. And everything we looked at kept coming up with a resounding yes. We talked to DNR and our friends at Trout Unlimited and they informed us what an important uh, watershed this is on the cool water that it provides to the Nemacogan River. The river's not on the property, but you can dang near throw a rock. It's about 500 feet or, or, or so from the property boundary. That's National Park Service land. And with all the sandy and gravelly soils on the Mount Telemark property, all the water sinks straight down. There's not a heck of a lot of standing water on that property. It goes straight into the ground and pops up in the river. So a tremendous resource is with regards to providing cold water habitat. Public access uh, for recreational use is obvious. It's got a tremendous and long history of that, dating back to Tony Wise, the Telemark Lodge, the Burke Biner, and more recently, mountain biking, fat biking, and snowshoeing, which have kind of more recent uh, popularity, I think, over the years. Uh, the Canva trails on site, which are mountain bike trails, and a snowmobile trail that crosses the property from east to west. So it's already got a tremendous history of public use. So then here we are, we're faced with a decision and we know American Berkbiner wants to sell it. They've got needs for, for capital because of their improvements they're planning on the east portion of the property and uh, have some looming payments and debt they need to take care of. And I completely understand that as a nonprofit, we have cash crunches as well that come and go over the years. Um, so we looked at what was necessary. We had the property appraised. We negotiated with uh, American Berkbiner and we agreed on the purchase price of 678,000. I'm trying to remember exactly when that happened. And I wanna say um, probably May, June, somewhere around there. So it was in the summertime. And with a really quick turnaround of a payment of 250 on July 30th, another 200 in October and, and an outstanding payment yet to make on November 1st. Um, for a land trust and our land trust in particular, that is warp speed. Um, you know, for taking a call on this property and spending about six months to get to a to get to a purchase price, and then having to close in another three months or so, that's warp speed for us. That would take us generally, you know, one and a half to two and a half years, probably in applying for grants, raising funds, negotiating, um, and typically we wouldn't close on a property till we have those funds in hand. Um, so we really kind of stuck our neck out on this. We didn't do so willy nilly. We spent a lot of time as a staff and a board discussing the opportunity, discussing the risks um, and making sure we had you know, a, fallback, a fallback plan. We did secure a loan uh, to allow us some flexibility for fundraising because we knew that was gonna take time. You just can't immediately launch a fundraising campaign as great as Kristen and, uh, and staff is at doing that. Um, it's gonna take a little time. And we look to see what partners we had available. Um, there's a lot of interested folks that are interested in seeing this uh, property protected. I mentioned Trout Unlimited, uh, but Gathering Waters, uh, who is our statewide service agency for land trusts, uh, Wild Rivers Conservancy, which oversees the St. Croix and Nemecagan, and the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Fund, which is a grant program administered by the Department of Natural Resources. There's other partners involved in this, obviously, Cable Natural History Museum, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few more. Um, so we definitely have advocates and partners in addition to all the folks that were calling us up, uh, inquiring of our potential to protect the property. And that brought us uh, to, you know, uh, our first couple of payments. And I want to just spend a minute or so talking about the status of our grant application to the Knowles Nelson Stewardship Program and then turn the mic over to our executive director, Lindsay Ketchell, to catch us up on the private fundraising. 
Uh, so part of our, our, uh, our plan for this was to apply for a Knowles Nelson grant. And just to kind of give you a little bit of background information on that grant program, it's a tremendous program and, and of tremendous importance to the folks of Wisconsin and has helped protect thousands of acres across our state in just about every county. It's a 50% cost share in most, situ most situations. So the department won't provide all the funding you need. They may provide up to half with a lot of things dependent. Um, so we, uh, we had the property appraised. Obviously we acquired it. We made the first couple of payments. We submitted a, a pretty substantial application package to the department. And then you sit and wait. Um, normal timeline for a grant to come, through, to come to fruition would be, I'm gonna say usually about a comfortable 12 months. It could be as much as 18 months. If there's barriers, it could take longer. Um, and there's a very involved and a very well-documented process on how um, they determine what or if you will be supplied in the way of funding. And there's no guarantee. Um, politically, Wisconsin is kind of a divided state, and that can happen sometimes where a red flag goes up in one part of the state or another that will help or hurt a project go through. So there may come a time... Uh, in this project where we'll call upon you to, to contact your elected officials. So right now we're optimistic that we will receive a Knowles Nelson stewardship grant. Oh, if I was a betting man, I would probably say sometime in the summer or early fall. Um, but there's a lot of different factors that that depends on and it could be earlier or later or not at all. Um, I think with that, I'm going to stop talking for a while and turn the mic over to our executive director, Lindsay Ketchell, who will catch you up on the status of our private fundraising and um, the opportunity before us tonight. Lindsay? Good job, Rick, thanks, appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for spending some time on this beautiful afternoon, evening, um, to learn a little bit more about the Telemark project and where we are with the fundraising. And I am delighted to let you know that this project has really seeded an interesting spark in so many folks. And I wanna first thank though the community members and some of you are on this call, who we call our the early adopters. So you were the earlier funders who helped put, um, fill in this, uh, the, the leaf very early on. And knowing that we had that strong early support really I think was the, the allowed us and our board to have the comfort and the security to move forward with this acquisition. Um, and then you were vocal and you were great and you continue to be great supporters. So we're very grateful. And then we um, proceeded. So we had a quiet phase, which is what most organizations do as a quiet phase. And we were very successful with that quiet phase. We recently had an appeal go out to a targeted mailing of folks. And as a result, we are getting those uh, responses daily um, in the mail. I will be fortunate, well, we're very fortunate that a couple of donors who have been a little lapped from Landmark had come back and rejoined us in this project, built some spark and interest for them. So we, we have to always understand that the projects are the exciting part we're just the conduit who gets the opportunity to help make it happen. And that's pretty exciting when you see um, donors get excited about work like this. Um, so in general, and this is the tricky part, we at Landmark and, and our overseeing of all these projects is the uncertainty around the Knowles Nelson grant. Rick mentioned earlier, typically we wait till after the grant has been secured We've raised the funds, we have a clear understanding, and we close on the project. In this case, we did it very much in a reverse um, format where we entered into a land contract and we had to expand ourselves a little bit as we move forward. Um, but I'm also delighted to say that each one of these payments is going to the America Berkebeiner Ski Foundation. So just know that the good fun funny, money that's supporting us is going right back to supporting it, and another great um, organization and a great partner. To help folks kind of get a sense of what some of our targets are moving forward, um, right now, if we anticipate, as Rick said, maybe 225,000 coming in from the Knowles Nelson acquisition, that would leave us needing to still raise $100,000 to secure and close on the acquisition. 
And then we also have added another $50,000 of uh, acquisition needs. Those have to do with the stewardship, the long-term maintenance of the property and covering some staff hours. Um, we, in, When we've been on the property, it became a little bit more apparent to us that we're gonna have to invest a little bit more time into that site to ensure that it's, it's sustained as a high recreational area. So we feel we have a very solid target of another 150,000 that we're hoping to raise. Um, and then, and then in, in conclusion and very quickly wrapping up, because really we're hoping this to be a, a good conversation and help you all learn a little bit more. But I can tell you that in my 30 plus years of doing this conservation work, the possibility of actually having an intact forest is non-attainable in so many other areas in the United States. In Northern Wisconsin, we have that opportunity. And I really, um, it's hard to explain to people that once something has been overdeveloped, you can't go back. Where we can do great strides is areas where it hasn't been overdeveloped and we're able to find that balance. And so this is just a huge opportunity for us and the conservation um, folks in this region. I've also mentioned how the community was the one who spearheaded this whole effort. And that's really how community conservation works. It's not a bunch of us sitting up here trying to figure out where to protect. It comes from the ground up, from individuals working and then building community interest and ownership to the property. So while we may hold it, indeed, it really will be in the hearts and of everybody who takes advantage of those. And I guess for me, in conclusion, as we look at our future and look for our future conservation leaders, I, one thing is clear, and I'm sure each and every single one of us will agree to this. It's our, been our personal experiences out in nature that seeded this deeper love and connection and appreciation. And it's so critical that we at Landmark maintain recreational opportunities so that folks can get out there and have those quiet moments and have those experiences that really kind of transform your heart and redirect you back to valuing and appreciating nature. It's very hard to go from surfing on a couch, playing you know, a game to then all of a sudden saying, I care tremendously about nature. It takes a lifetime, it takes generations, it takes experiences. And so for me, that's also so critical. And as we look at our partnership with the America Berkebiner Ski Foundation, I kind of think this is like priceless, the chance to interact with and engage with all those skiers like Bill and many of you others to help enlighten you and hope we can cultivate more bills who will be chairs of our land trusts in all regions. You know, those skiers come from all over and they have such a great love and a connection for the outdoors. So it doesn't take a lot to then make that next connection to habitat and other uh, resiliency protection. So to me, this just turns into such a win-win-win for Wisconsin. And, um, and with that, I'm open to any questions, um, ideas, uh, e impact or in, um, input um, would be grateful. So thank you for taking some time and uh, yeah. And I think, are we just gonna open it up? Um, I see Ed has his hand up. Uh, there aren't any questions in the chat, so we can just dive right into some real time conversation. Um, Ed, I see you're unmuted, go ahead. Uh, just two questions. One, I was just kind of confused about the, the numbers that you were throwing around with regard to what you need and what you've gotten. I guess, what's, what's the bottom line as to how much you need to, to raise? That's one question. And the other thing has to do is kind of uh, the future of this um, forest that you're conserving. Will it just be kind of a static piece of property? Or will it will it uh, will it be any harvesting going on, or uh, yeah. clearing out the brush, or to improve the health yeah. of the forest, or what's the expectations there? Thank yep. you. Okay, and I will make a, a first stab, and then Rick, please chime in. I'll start with the forestry, and then move to the funding. 
Um, it is my understanding, and we've had a number of foresters and staff walk the property, that in fact, this forest is in very good, good shape and won't really require much harvesting, if anything at all. Um, we see ourselves um, investing more maybe with some of the recreation trails and signage areas but the actual oversight and management of the forest should not require significant harvesting or even thinning, I think, at this point in time. So that's the great news. There's not a ton of land management long term expenses. Uh, on the short term, though, there are a number of trails that are on the property. There's a, a trailhead very close to it. So we would want to make sure that we improve on recreational signage and just educating folks of the benefit of the properties and maybe some interpretive trail experiences if appropriate. Um, and then did that help you add on the forestry and land management piece? I think he's muted. Rick, do you want to add anything more? Not, not too much, uh, Lindsay. No, I would just say, yeah, like you said, I don't anticipate us needing to harvest there. There are sites that we own and manage now that we that we have conducted timber harvests on. I don't see this being one of them. Yeah. Um, if anything, we would probably want to enhance the species composition with some targeted planting. Um, you know, there's oak wilt. Uh, not too far away. If that ever became an issue, we might have to address it. But by and large, um, there's enough young aspen around. I don't think we need to be cutting too heavy, making more of it. Yep. And it's got, you know, in my imagination is, you know, or my thoughts are in 50, 75, maybe even 100 years, you're, you're looking at the makings of old, old growth forest. And I had the fortune to work in and protect old growth forest in the Tongass National Forest. And that's really unique forestry. And you have some very unique um, forest up here in Wisconsin. Now back to the money, and I apologize for confusing folks um, because um, yes, to be clear, when it comes to additional funds, we feel we'd like to secure in the next five months is I'm hoping to secure an additional $100,000 to go towards the acquisition and then I'm anticipating that I'll receive maybe 225,000 from Knowles Nelson. Those combinations should cover our acquisition costs, but there's always a slight chance that the Knowles Nelson might not come together. But I don't want to over, you know, but, but ideally we'll get the 225,000 and raise an additional 100,000. And then separate from that, Ed, we as an organization are going to be looking at raising another 50000 over the next, say, five to 10 months. Those funds, though, are earmarked towards stewardship and trail maintenance and my staff hours involved in not only this acquisition work, um, but then future maintenance work. So, so to date, my staff, all the staff time we've invested in this acquisition is coming from general operating support dollars. Sorry if this is a little too technical, but we, we'd like to recoup a little bit of that through the acquisition because we've invested so much time. So that's what we're looking at is about a, a target of 150,000 over the next five months. And again, the target towards the acquisition is 100,000. which I think is very doable. Um, and But I will be up front too in saying that some of our partners that we thought, and just so you know, when we got involved in this project, a number of other conservation projects, partners called us up and said, this is great, this is so great, we wanna support you, how can we help you? But one of those groups we thought through their group's efforts might help us raise 20,000, but we just found out that they only brought in $700. So it's sometimes very difficult to forecast fundraising um, and who's going to have an interest or not. Um, and But I will also say that Kristen, who's our uh, advancement director here, who runs really the programs, our advancement programs, 
does a great job of following through, interacting, and assisting anyone who's interested in making a donation to this project. So we're here to hold hands and hearts too. Thanks, Lindsay. Any additional questions from folks? We uh, we got plenty of time in our hour that we budgeted here, um, and we're grateful to to hear from more people. Everybody's feeling a little shy. We could call on people. I was going to say Patrick. We should call on <laughs> Patrick. <laughs> How's the conservation easement progressed? The long language progressing with ABSF for the middle part. Um, they have inquired of a time frame to start working on that easement, and I have a feeling it'll probably be next year that we'll have the staff capacity. So they are aware that an easement has to be drafted, and they did reach out to us. Um, so, actually, in, interesting, though, they also have a grant pending with Knowles Nelson for that middle portion. And so the easement is something that they really can't execute until that grant would kind of go through um you and know there can't there can't be any encumbrances on the title at the time that they're uh right um, working through that process sorry patrick go ahead right How, how's the temperature in your discussions with camba about uh their trail use through this property and perhaps the absf piece um you know we're really excited about uh the potential for Kind of developing those partnerships further um, you know our mission is land protection and we don't have a lot of staff on the ground for actual land management you know it's we we do the annual monitoring and and some improvements as we see fit and as we have capacity to do but i think the the partnerships in, in the cable area will be really key to being able to sustain um, the level of trails that are currently present on the property and, and that, I, would, that would include the north end ski club and that would include uh the um the the local snowmobile trail i i, I know i know and i hear you about and we all hear you about the importance of sustainability and resilience and protection and how important it is um including hunting um but there, there are always compromises and there's always a uh, balance that we have to strike, right, with our communities. Yeah. And um, what you're doing here, protecting this property, although it might be used for, for, for other things, maybe more uses than you'd like, this is a, an amazing community of uh, trail users and, right. and public um, property stewards. And um, I, I'd hate to see <clears throat> I'd hate to see, for even, instance, even the the uh, snowmobile community locked out because of this corridor. Um, as much as you may or may not enjoy that um, that sport, it's a big part of this community. And as yeah. is Canva, as is the North End Ski Club, and I really appreciate your consideration of all those user groups uh, as it relates to this property. And thank you. Yeah, appreciate that, Patrick. And just to share with everyone, we will be granting a one-year um, um, easement for the snowmobile trail. Um, they contacted us. We granted that. We've had early discussions. They'd like for something to be a little bit more permanent. And we obviously want to work with this community to make sure that that's, in fact, kind of the collective thought uh, moving forward. Um, and then they were actually interested in maybe helping out with some of the fundraising, too, because I because I think we're all in this together, <laughs> both silent and non-silent sport enthusiasts. That, that, that was my point. And there's, yep. there's a lot of give and take required. And you guys are have demonstrated your ability to do that and I thank you very much. Yeah. More so questions. I know everyone's so quiet. <laughs> Any I'm just trying to think. 
Um, I, well, I, I'll just point out in case, uh, hopefully folks have, have been receiving a couple of emails from me as part of participating in this meeting today. But if you'd rather um, communicate one-on-one -on -one, um, and follow up with a question by email or schedule a phone call, we really invite you to, you know, yeah. make sure that, that you feel heard. And if you'd rather, you know, bring up your questions um, in a phone call or, or um, individually, please reach out. Yeah, and, and I would suggest this too, because I know a lot of you are already champions of this project who are on this call. Some of you are new to this effort, but you know, the real power, work, the po point of this campaign we're at right now is really to share with others and, and expand the awareness. So we have a limitation. We have a fairly large database of, 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 of supporters. And what we've been finding is that we've actually been introducing conservation projects to new funders and they're really joining in on this effort and getting excited to support these efforts. And so beyond just thinking about yourself and your own giving capacity, think also about really who else would be interested in this, because that's the power, I think, or the stage we're at in this campaign is in addition to your own personal interest is how do we get a broader subsection of your friends, your family, you know, like-minded folks who may not be as aware of receive these materials. You know, are there ways that we can share these materials? We have an e-newsletter, um, you know, things of that nature. So, you know, you can we can lightly introduce them to this project. Um, and, you know, and, and I would also say, so it's not always about money, it's about who you know. And then I would also like to share that we're always looking for champions for this project too. We do videos sometimes and capture that. I know, Patrick, you did such a great job when we were up at Cable a couple months ago, um, sharing about the importance of this project with, with potential donors. And so there's many roles and many ways that folks can get involved and help. And then once obviously, and we will be closing on the property and then looking for ways that volunteers can help us with the oversight of the facility too, and, and, and playing an active role um, and, and feeling that, that community ownership. But at this point in time, you know, those are the sort of things that we're looking for. Um, or I should say Kristen and Bill and others too. <laughs> so if you have any ideas, any other networks, groups of people, ways to connect. Um, so, cause sadly we end up a lot of times, um, yeah, let's leave it at that. Well, I think you, I, I know it's a something you, <clears throat> how do I put this? I liked your point that by, by contributing to this conservation effort, you are contributing to the American Birkebeiner Ski Foundation. Yes. It was land that they recently acquired that they've sold to Landmark and that those funds are used and were used for all their operating costs and the demolition of the uh, the, the whale, I think, Rick, you called it. Um, but um, it, it, for people that want to give to the community as a whole, the American Birkebeiner Ski Foundation, I know they're actively fundraising and to this project, you are helping protect 218 acres here and helping the American Birkebeiner by making this a contribution toward this $100,000. So yeah. um, I think it's a real, uh, again, win-win. It's a real opportunity to make your donation to Landmark and you're also benefiting the whole community and the uh, ABSF. Yeah. Um, at least that that's what I'm, I've been telling people not to detract from the efforts at ABSF because we're we're obviously donating there as well. But um, it, it's worth noting, I just wanted yeah. to say, when you're talking to others. Yeah. Yep. Hi, hey, folks. So I'm Ellen LaFonce from Outside of Cable. And I just wanted to really uh, voice my appreciation to the Landmark Conservancy for what you've done. Um, you know. I think this is really great work and I hope we can get more and more people behind um, knowing more about this and appreciating how, you know, this uh, property is going to be conserved for generations to come. So I commend you. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Thank you.
Sure. Nice, nice to see you. I've we've spoken on the phone once or twice, but it's great to see you. Yeah, you too, Kristen. Any additional questions? I think we're in pretty good shape. And we'll be up on Saturday up to the hog roast that we'll be having. We're very much looking forward to that. And uh and then other ideas too, other events, other ideas that you guys can think of to help get the word out, um, whether they're hikes this, you know, maybe we can go snowshoeing this winter and do some fundraising around that. So, uh, you know, we're never short on, I should say we have lots of ideas and we're building a strong staff to help implement all those great ideas too. So, um, but thank you for taking time, appreciate it. And please do go ahead and connect us with, with others as you see fit. We're really uh, eager to continue building connections and cable and, and be a stronger um, partner in that community. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Have, have, a, have a good evening, everyone. Enjoy the sun. <laughs>